Our next speaker is joining us via the miracle of uh, the internet. <clears throat> Roy, are you there? Excellent. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm with you. Yes. I I'd like to introduce uh, Roy Harrison from the University of Birmingham and uh, Center for Atmospheric Sciences. Please take it away, Roy. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, for, firstly, many thanks for the invitation to address this meeting, and my apologies for not having been able to come in person. Uh, the, I've been watching the webcast, and it's hugely impressive, um, so I hope this comes across uh, adequately through it as well. And I'll try and use the mouse as a pointer, which I, I hope will work for you. Roy, and I'm sorry, should... can, can you share your screen? I don't think it's showing. Ah, I, my apologies. Um, let me try to get back again. No, I, I haven't got the share screen option showing at the moment. I don't know why. I've got the ball, but not the share screen. So I don't know how to deal with that. Roy, uh, we've pulled your slides up. If you uh, would simply like to, uh, starting with your title slide uh, page, go ahead and ask us when we should, uh, tell us when we should turn the slide for you, please. Okay, that, that, that's fine. Unfortunately, I won't be at a point in that case then. Um, I was going to preface my remarks also by, by saying that I was very interested in the uh, discussion earlier on heterogeneity, and that's something that won't be reflected in my talk. We, a lot of it is actually based on unoccupied buildings, uh, and although heterogeneity may be a minor issue there, I don't think it's a major issue. So the environments are either homogeneous or assumed to be homogeneous. Now, um, if I could have the first slide, please. Th this is just an overview of the presentation. I'll be talking a certain amount about the sources of indoor particles, sinks for indoor particles, determinants of indoor-outdoor ratios, and some reflections on the health risk, which is what I think uh, drives the rationale for this work. Um, I'll move quite quickly through some of the earlier parts because there's a lot of overlap with, with some of the messages in the earlier presentations, and I agree with the uh, comments of the earlier chair that there was a huge amount of very valuable information there. So if I could have the, f the next slide, please. Uh, these are measurements that we made a very long time ago in an empty office on a very busy London highway, Marylebone Road, uh, which shows substantial uh, wind direction dependent penetration of pollutants indoors uh, and the highest efficiencies appear to be for the accumulation mode particles and certainly we found higher indoor outdoor ratios for PM 2.5 than PM 10 in the absence of outdoor of, sorry, in the absence of indoor sources um, so if I could have the uh, slide please the next one which, which should be a graph um, showing in the red the outdoor concentrations, in the black the indoor concentrations. Uh, and we're seeing on average an indoor-outdoor ratio of about 0 0.75, and that's for, for PM 2.5. Um, and when we analyzed that data set in more detail, we found there was a lag of about 20 minutes between the um, the indoor concentrations and the outdoor concentrations. So it's a classic situation, empty room, outdoors, driving the indoors. Uh, next slide uh, is also an indoor-outdoor situation. And on the left, we see PM10, and on the right, we see PM1. The black is outdoor PM10, and the 
red is indoor PM10. Um, substantial reduction in concentrations indoors, uh, but some big spikes there associated with cooking activities and people entering the house and, and uh, causing some uh, dust suspension or other source of particles. And we're seeing very similar phenomena on the right for PM1, again, with the outdoors driving the indoors for much of the time and then some of these huge spikes when the cooking happens. The next slide takes us into particle number space, and I will be talking quite a lot about particle numbers. Uh, and as those of you who don't work explicitly on these things will have picked up earlier, particle number is reflecting the ultrafine fraction in particular. And th this is a time series uh, uh, over 155 hours. Uh, and th this is an occupied house, as was the last one. And the black is the indoors, and we see some huge spikes in concentration there. Um, the outdoor, the red line is the outdoor measurements made immediately outside of the house, and the green line is a central site um, some kilometers from the location of, of this house. And we were trying to evaluate whether the central site was a useful predictor of both the outdoor and indoor concentrations at the site. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, on the left, uh, there is a graph showing a plot of the indoor data as the y-axis versus the outdoor data. Uh, and we see no clear relationship whatever. Now, if we then edit the indoor data with, with explicit criteria uh, to take out the big spikes, and we do take some um, abnormal data out of the outdoor data as well, we get the right-hand graph where we get a very good relationship, or quite a good relationship, between the indoor uh, particle number concentrations and the outdoor concentrations. Uh, but we're seeing uh, a much bigger attenuation uh, of the indoor concentrations for particle number than we see for particle mass. We, we're seeing a really very substantial reduction there in the indoor numbers compared to outdoor when we believe we're looking solely at the penetration of outdoor particles to the indoor environment. So if I could have the next slide, that summarizes the issue on particle number, that we found that the home outdoor to central site correlations are often quite high. Uh, but indoor, outdoor, and indoor central site relationships were very low indeed, very poor unless the peaks are rising from indoor sources relative from the data set. Uh, no big surprises there, and I'll go on to elaborate on this. The next slide shows uh, a rather strange building. Um, it, 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 it's actually a, uh, although it doesn't look it, a relatively modern addition to some older buildings. And it, it, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a walkway including offices between two older buildings which crosses a, a busy highway. And uh, th this, this is um, a fairly sealed building which had very little ventilation of, of, of any kind in it. And we looked at the indoor-outdoor relationships f for that rather strange uh, building. Uh, and the next slide shows the particle size distributions that we measured indoors and outdoors uh, using different instruments to evaluate different size particles going through from, I think, at the lower end around three nanometers up, up to close to two micrometers at, at the upper end of the size range. Note those are logarithmic scales on the y-axis. So if we transform that in the next slide into indoor-outdoor ratios by particle size, uh, we get 
what I think is quite a surprising picture, which may, may be peculiar to such a, a poorly ventilated building, uh, as I stress, unoccupied, which, which is that at the lower end of the size range, we're seeing a fairly rapid cutoff in the indoor concentrations below, say, 30 nanometers below that. There's a, a very large, very sharp reduction. The central accumulation mode, I suppose it's, it's actually the lower end of what's normally taken to the accumulation mode, around 100 nanometers, we're seeing quite strong penetration, and that's where a lot of the surface area in the mass of particles is. And in this particular situation, I wouldn't uh, want to generalize on this, but in this particular situation, we, we're seeing a very rapid decline at the larger particle end of this. Uh, and the mechanisms will be various for this, uh, and I'll come on to this later as to what may be responsible for this behavior, but I wouldn't claim that it's, uh, it's going to be typical of all buildings. Certainly if there were better ventilation, certainly better natural ventilation, I wouldn't expect to see such a sharp drop off at the larger particle end of that size spectrum. So if I could have the next slide, please. Moving on to measurements in Bologna in, in Italy. Um, this was work carried out um, in an unoccupied room. There are actually two buildings, one, one located in a heavily trafficked location, one in a background location. Uh, room volumes in both cases were about 55 cubic meters and we were sampling with FMPS instruments, both indoors and outdoors. But in order to um, negate issues relating to possible particle removal as it penetrates the building shell, we were actually pumping air into the center of the room at, at a measured exchange rate of, of half a, a, a 0 0.5 per hour exchange rate. Uh, which was, was validated with tracer measurements. And we also validated the fact that our infiltration method didn't uh, cause particle losses of any significance. So in this situation, we're looking purely at the sinks. We're looking at particle losses due to deposition, coagulation, and evaporation. And the next slide shows the PM2.5 concentrations um, at the top, and these are the average values o o over uh, a period of some days. And uh, it, it's for three separate uh, experimental runs, which you can see marked. Uh, and uh, this is looking at both the traffic outdoor, traffic indoor, which are the far left um, uh, of each pair of, uh, of bars, and the residential outdoor, residential indoor. Uh, there's not a great deal of difference in PM2.5 between the traffic and the residential sites, <coughs> excuse me, and we see that in some of the campaigns, and there is some, there were some seasonal differences in these campaigns, but in, in some of the campaigns, we were seeing a substantial loss of PM2.5. In others, it was very small. And if we move into the lower part of that uh, slide, the graph at the bottom, we're looking in particle number space, and we're seeing in all cases quite substantial loss of particle number between uh, indoor, well, between outdoors and indoors. And we were interested in trying to understand some of the processes that were driving those sinks. The next slide relates to chemical species and, uh, again, pa pairs of, of curves for the traffic site on the left, the residential on the right, and for different chemical species marked above the, the slides, uh, sorry, above each of the separate graphs. Most notable, and this chimes with a lot of what we've heard earlier on today, there's a huge loss of nitrate. There's virtually no nitrate indoors uh, 
uh, in either of the locations. So we've got a probably a 95% plus loss of nitrate. We're also losing a lot of ammonium. We're seeing much less loss of sulfate. And the organic carbon, which again has been getting a lot of attention in this particular case for the uh, unoccupied building, there's very little change in the concentration of organic carbon. And, and I would assume that in some of these um, measurements that we've seen earlier, where there's a substantial increase in the proportion and even the mass of organic carbon, or HOA anyway, in the indoor environment, uh, that may be the result of indoor VOC sources that may not have been present in, in this particular location. Now, the next slide shows the mean particle size distributions uh, indoors and outdoors. Um, looking at mobility diameters from 10, well, about 15 nanometers, no, about uh, 13 nanometers probably on the left, th through to um, somewhere around uh, 600, 5, 600 on the right. Uh, and towards the right, we see very little uh, apparent loss of particles between the outdoors and the indoors, so that's above about 250 nanometers. There's rather little loss, which is pretty consistent with the data that I showed from the peculiar building in Birmingham. Uh, but at the mode, for example, of the traffic outdoor site uh, at around... 30 nanometers, we're seeing a huge loss uh, down from that top curve to the next curve. Um, so we've got a very size dependent loss process, um, which is especially pronounced for the traffic site. If we look at the residential site, which is the triangles, there, there seems to be a much less of a size dependent loss. There's still a substantial loss, but for some reason, and I think I can speculate on what it is, there, there is a different degree of loss. And uh, averaging those data we see on the next slide, we see indoor-outdoor ratio as a function of particle diameter at the trafficked location. Uh, and we, we're seeing a very strong loss of particles below about 100 nanometers. Now, there are a number of likely reasons for that. One is that the deposition velocities of the particles are likely to be somewhat greater in, in, those, in the nanoparticle range. Uh, a second reason uh, is seen in the next slide, which should be a more colorful slide if things are coming up in sequence. Um, and there, we've modeled losses due to coagulation. Uh, and this is calculated over, over a six hour period, um, just in order to look at the size dependence of coagulation processes. And the hot colors, the red, uh, shows the highest reduction in particle number density. The, the left-hand axis, the y-axis, is, is time. So it's going, time is going upwards in the graph and particle diameter across the bottom. So we're seeing the biggest losses by coagulation in these particles in about the 30 to 50 nanometer range uh, and the most rapid losses uh, in, in the earlier time periods. So coagulation almost certainly is a mechanism there if the number concentrations are high enough. But the other reason that we think is very important is that particles are being lost due to evaporation, which runs contrary to some of the earlier discussion, although evaporation was discussed as well as condensation. But remember that this is an unoccupied building and that the walls are likely to act as a sink for 
semi-volatile organic compounds, meaning that there will be a transfer from the particles to the wall. And in this nucleation range, down at 20, 30 nanometers, many of the particles are traffic generated. They have a substantial, in fact, their predominant composition is semi-volatile organics. And we're working very heavily on those, uh, looking at compounds predominantly in the range of C20 to C35. And at the lower end of that size range, those particles are very volatile. And we see substantial losses, which we can determine in the atmosphere when traffic generated particles, in this case from diesels, um, move into much cleaner air, for example, advected into a park. Now, if we move to the next slide, this is another study carried out in Bologna. And it is a plan of a building on the left-hand side. And at the lower part of the slide, we see a heavily trafficked street. And we've sampled at the front of the building and at the rear of the building. And that building is 38 meters in length between the front and the rear. And we've sampled both indoors and outside of that building. And the next slide shows the PM2.5 concentrations uh, on the left in the hot period of the year and on the right, the cold period, um, for the front, indoor, uh, and outdoor, uh, to the extreme left, then coming inwards, the back, outdoor, and indoor. And we don't see a huge amount of difference there in the hot period. In the cold period, we're seeing a very big difference uh, between outdoors and indoors at both the front and the rear. And I think the difference between the periods is probably the fact that there will be a very substantial nitrate content in the cold period, which doesn't exist in the hot period, and that's evaporating indoors. The next slide is showing the particle size distribution data. Um, during the cold period, and Interestingly, the only large concentrations, the, uh, um, the dark, dotted li uh, dark line with circles, is the front outdoor. And by the back outdoor, we've seen a huge loss. Now, comparing that with NOx, which I don't show in this, this graph, but there's a much more substantial loss than there is for NOx, which I think is evaporation as these particles move in, into cleaner air. So th that is perhaps an important factor in determining outdoor concentrations. And again, we see big losses as they advect indoors with, again, the traffic affected front of the building particles showing much bigger losses than the particles at the back of the building, where I think the semi-volatiles are probably already lost before they get to that point. Moving on to the next slide, uh, we're looking at a completely different scenario. Uh, and we're looking at individual sources of particles. And this was an experiment uh, in an apartment in Prague. We're, we're doing a tour of Europe. Uh, we've got to Prague so far. And in Prague, uh, we're, we're seeing the, the largest sources, the scales on all of these graphs are different. The largest sources indoors are cooking in terms of particle number. Remember, we're still in particle number space. Cooking and um, cleaning materials. And this is a spray cleaner, but I would expect the spray to be pretty coarse. And both from the size distribution, and we measure the hygroscopicity of these particles, um, these appear to be limonene oxidation products. So again, that chimes with the earlier work we were hearing about uh, with uh, these um, 
organic compounds which are used extensively in cleaning agents and their indoor oxidation very rapidly causing uh, a major source of particles which it appears didn't decrease with time as quickly as some of the other sources which would fit with it being produced indoors. Now the talk has in its title it has exposure as well as concentrations and in the next slide I'd like to just share with you some data from a, a study we carried out a very long time ago looking at the relationship between fixed measurements in, a, in, a, um, in an occupied room and personal measurements in that room uh, in a location where we didn't expect strong indoor concentration gradients. And for carbon monoxide, we see that there is a very close one-to-one, -one, almost one-to-one -one relationship between the personal exposure and the static sampler. Uh, with virtually no intercept. So the personal exposure uh, is very well reflected by the static sampler. Similarly for nitrogen dioxide, there's a bit more scatter there, but again, a fairly good relationship with, in this case, a small uh, intercept. But for PM10, we're seeing a personal measurement, which is always higher than the static measurement, with a, an intercept of 17 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, and that is something one tends not to hear about nowadays, but at the time we did this work, there was a lot of talk about personal clouds. Uh, and I assume some of that personal cloud is probably the skin that, that is shed that we've heard about in earlier talks, but also dust from clothing and sources of that sort. Uh, so it's worth bearing in mind that personal exposures to PM, and this applies to a lesser extent to PM2.5 than PM10, but nonetheless still applies to fine particles to some extent, that exposures can be significantly higher than measured indoor concentrations uh, because of this personal cloud effect. My next slide uh, is some reflections on the meaning of all this, or perhaps the lack of meaning of all this, because I think there are some very important questions that this doesn't actually address significantly at all. Uh, and the first of these is that the question that I regard certainly as unresolved of the differential toxicity of particles from different sources or with different composition and size is crucial. Um, and behind this is thinking, well, are these particles from cooking, for example, are they as toxic as the traffic particles? Is the elemental carbon component of diesel particles um, comparable in toxicity to the organic component, which is largely from lubricating oil? How does that compare with the toxicity of nitrates, which are uh, very reduced in concentration indoors? Secondly, um, essentially what, I, what I've just said, are particles from indoor origins, such as food cooking and resuspended house dust, as toxic as the outdoor pollutant mixture measured in most epidemiological studies? I don't believe anyone's adequately address that issue, and it's a very tough one to address through research. Very difficult to design studies that are going to do that, I think. Thirdly, um, particle losses in the home are both size and composition dependent. The building's very protective in relation to nanoparticles, less than 100 nanometers diameter, and semi-volatile constituents, nitrates and semi-volatile organic <laughs> carbon compared to the accumulation mode and the non-volatile particles. Does this matter? I, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure that anyone does. And, and finally, what are the determinants and significance of the personal cloud of particles? So th those, those are the issues that I would like to throw in for, for thought and discussion.
Uh, my next slide is acknowledgements to colleagues, uh, both at Birmingham and elsewhere in Europe, who've collaborated in, in some of the studies that I've shown you. And the final slide is to thank you very much for your attention. And, and my apologies that, for some reason, I don't have the share screen I, icon here, so I couldn't actually uh, put up the um, presentation for you on the screen myself. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roy.